Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Pain, Pleasure and My Will presentation, Jesus talks about gaining a soul-based understanding of the true causes of pleasure and pain, sin, the results of sin, and encourages us to be sensitive to the true cost of using our will unlovingly. Recorded on the 26th of February 2016 in Newseville, Queensland, Australia. Interesting topic this, isn't it? Pain, pleasure and my will is the topic. You'd think with how much pain that the world itself is in and often how much pain we ourselves are in that we'd understand the cause of pain, wouldn't you? <laughs> but the reality is we just do not understand the true causes of pain. We don't. And, and this is something that's very, very important to understand, what the real cause of pain is and what the real cause of pleasure is. Because many of us are addicted to doing things that we believe give us a you know, pleasure-based feeling, but in, in, the, in fact, it's going to result in pain. And many of us are avoiding the things that could give us a, uh, you know, that we believe could give us a painful feeling when actually it's going to give us pleasure. And that's what you would expect, wouldn't it, if our definition is completely the <laughs> of love is completely different than God. So, so obviously that's something that we can, something that we need to analyse. So what I'd like to do now with you is to talk about with you the true causes of pain and the true cause of pleasure and also ask you the question about which way are we using our will in regard to these particular two things. Now, what I notice is that the majority of people, as I've said, all they do is they spend a lot of their life engaging behaviour which actually causes pain, but which they believe will give them pleasure. And when you think about it, that's quite like crazy, isn't it, when you think about it? that we do that, but we do, we do do that. And this is why the majority of us, by the time we get into our 50s or 60s, we're starting to feel the effects of this kind of choice in our life. And if not before then, if not before then. All right, so what are the true causes of pain and what are the true causes of pleasure is the question. All right. Now what I'm going to do is outline them very carefully for you. Um, because I, I, and I'm going to outline each one of them in three different ways. Uh, that all mean the same thing. So that, so that you get some sort of a grasp of what, what it means. Does that make sense? So, so the true cause of pain. Is having the intent to sin so that's one definition intending to sin or you could say the aspiration or desire to sin inside of my soul Now, what's another way of saying that? Well, you've, you've seen the outline, so you should know. What, what is it? <laughs> Can we, um, maybe Lily, you want to say? Um, I can't remember the outline, but I have seen it. Um, so I'm just going to guess desiring to sin. Is that the same thing, basically? Oh, it's the same thing, yeah. Okay. Let's say it another way, is what I'm looking That's for. That's what I was doing. Yeah. Um, if we had to carry on this side. <coughs> Using my will um, uh, out of the definition of God's 
um, love, a definition of love? Yeah, so using my will out of harmony with God's definition of love. It's another way of saying it. Using my will out of harmony with God's definition of love. What's the third way of saying it? Hey, Mary? <coughs> uh, using my will to break uh, God's loving laws. Exactly. So using my will. These all mean the same thing. To break God's loving laws. So what, if I can just go a bit further, Rita, rather than we comment about it just yet. Um, using my will to break God's laws. Okay, so here we are. We've got three definitions which actually mean exactly the same thing, right? And all of them will result in pain. Every single one of them will result in pain. Now you notice we don't even have to do it. We could just have the intent or the aspiration or the desire to do it. And that's enough all right, to cause pain. You notice also that with regard to pain, pain, the reason why I've raised the issue of pain is because pain is a, like to me it's a, an instant thing. It's not a, we're not talking about suffering here. We're just talking about pain versus pleasure as an as a instant feeling, right? So that's the true cause, that's the true cause of pain. You notice also it doesn't matter where the sin came from. Like it doesn't matter whether somebody else put it inside of you through their intent to sin or whether it came from your own choices and decisions. At the end of the day, if the sin's inside of you um, and you intend to act upon that, it's going to cause pain. It doesn't matter where it came from. This is where we've got to start sort of not worrying so much where it came from and just instead focusing on feeling it now of course sometimes when you know where it came from it's easier to feel uh, that's true but but we need to stop the analytical process of trying to work out where it came from when we already know what it feels like <laughs> and just feel it instead yeah okay so there's pain <clears throat> now is there any comments or questions you'd like to ask at this point uh, if we come down to pamela Cross to Catherine as well. Wouldn't there be included in that also using my will to resist God's truth? Well, that's a sin. Okay. Resisting God's sin, yeah. and we've already said okay. having the intent to sin. Yeah. Resisting God's truth is breaking God's laws. Yeah. So it already falls into that. Yep. Catherine? <coughs> it also doesn't matter whether we're on this path or not it, it everybody has it you know it's not just us that's right yeah it makes no difference who we are where we are it doesn't even make a difference even if we're in the spirit world or here no it makes, it makes right. no difference location location on the earth it makes no difference well that's what i like about it. it's consistent right if we come to rob I'm just, I'm just gonna have to have a cough um, it's an active state on our behalf. It's not a passive thing, you know. Like uh, no, sin can actually be a passive thing too. Okay. Mm. Where you just choose to not do something. Right. Yep. So having the intent to not do something can be the intent to sin too. So the other two are more sort of active, but. Well, it, it, having the intent to not do something is using your will out of harmony with love. Like love might dictate you do something. Right, and and you choose to not do it, then you've sinned. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So so it's it's not about ac the activity or the lack of activity because both may involve sin. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good. And if we go to Rita, and then up to William. 
So this also means as soon as my intent changes, whether I am in the depth of the hell in, on earth, like in prison or whatever, mm, tortured, mm -hmm. or in the depth of the hell in the spirit world, as soon as my intent changes, I get help. Exactly. I get spirit's help, or God's help, or something changes within me, and the pain, the physical or emotional pain, is released, or it's starting it's to... It's starting, the process is beginning, yes. Yep. And the opposite is also true. As soon as I exercise my resistance, obviously there's going to be consequences there, because that's also out of harmony <laughs> with God's laws of love and truth. Yep. William? I just wanted to know... Um, Sin, it, it is the sin itself, it's not the desire, like can... <clears throat> no, remember it's the desire, intent, remember I said aspiration, intent or desire to sin? Yes. So can you have sin inside of yourself with no desire to act upon it? Uh, highly unlikely, yep, but you can not act upon it and also have no desire to act upon it, but, uh, but, but it's highly unlikely. But also the sin still is inside of yourself so that causes the second thing. So you can actually stop your pain while at the same time not stop your suffering. Well, let's look at suffering and see what the definition of suffering is. So what's suffering? Suffering is... Like the definitions there are written down for you. So if you come down to Ange, or you can you can have a stab if you want without without what's there. <laughs> the prolonging of sin. Well, uh, you could say the prolonging of sin, but let's be a bit more specific than than that. Um, if we come up the back, see. So. <coughs> I'm reading this, not remembering. That's okay, Jalen. That's fine. Um, refu refusing to remove from inside of myself my soul, the desire, aspiration or intent to sin over a long period. Okay, so, so this one's having it and this one's refusing to remove it. So one is an instant in time, the other is over a period of time. One is having it inside of oneself and one is refusing to remove it inside from oneself. <coughs> so you can actually, can't you, have suffering without having pain. The instant pain of sinning, you can stop sinning but still have suffering by not releasing the previous sin. Can you see? Right. Okay. So you could say it's refusing to use my will in harmony with love over a period. You could also say suffering is refusing to use my will or using my will to break God's laws over a period of time that's going to create suffering. So one is about having a period of time and refusing to live in harmony with love and truth. The other is what happens instantly in time. Right, right, moment the moment you choose. You follow? Yeah, if we go to Paige and then down to Alan front here. AJ, I'm a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. Isn't refusing to remove the sin that's already in our soul Mm -hmm. Also a sin? Of course it is. Which would then cause pain? Well, it causes more suffering than pain, doesn't it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Refusing to remove something just leaves it in there. It's a bit like if you can think of sin like a, having a splinter in your arm or something, right? Now, the pain is when it just shoots in. There and then you've got some pain, right? But the reality is you could leave it in there and sometimes it's not that painful for a little while, is it? after the initial pain it's not that painful to leave it there and you know in your past you might have even chosen to do that at some points in time but what happens in with your body 
the the wound starts festering and it starts, you know, you get a whole pus around it and it all starts trying to reject it. And then, and then whenever you touch it, it's painful again and painful again and painful again whenever you just touch it. That's like the suffering that happens from not removing the problem immediately. You follow? Yep. Thanks. Helen? So the 20 odd billion spirits who uh, have not chosen to go to the spirit world and have avoided their pain, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, Which, let's face it, most of us would probably do when we passed. Well, let's, I don't <laughs> understand the mechanism why someone like Sarah in that mediumship went straight to the spirit world, whereas the 20 billion people didn't. What, what's the mechanism or the choice or is there a choice? Well, Sarah obviously had some awakening to her sin to, to go to the spirit world. She also, by the way, didn't tell her whole story. So, you know, it, we need to, you know, we, we were summarising her story rather than telling her whole story. So you've got to be careful about, you know, getting a summary and then applying it in reality. The reality is most people who pass, who have heavy addictions here on the earth, are earthbound for a period of time. How long that time is depends very much upon how satisfied they are with meeting their addictions here. Mm. So with Glenn, mm -hmm. um, he would have spent time here first being lonely before he went over to... He well, he was already lonely on earth, so there was not much to hold him here. He, yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas with, Sa with Sarah, the, oh, sorry, the, yeah, Sarah, the, the French woman, uh, there was more to hold her here. She still had family here. She has still had her two daughters here and so forth. So there was more to hold her here, more to try to get her to influence those particular people. That's why it took nearly 100 years or so for her to have some realisations because uh, some portion of that she spent on Earth, Earthbound. Does that make sense? Yep. But she didn't seem aware of when she was Earthbound. She just said, well... My understanding was she just focused on being in darkness and getting attacked. And yeah, and but that happen on, on Earth as an earthbound. Most person. people who are earthbound are not aware of their being earthbound. Mm. They're just getting the addiction met. They don't really care where it comes from. Do you see? And for most of them, they're not even aware they've died for a period of time. Most of them can't see the people that they're connecting to on Earth. They just feel the they just feel the cord that pulls them together yeah. that's all but they're connecting with those people and they they're still feeling their anger like she was feeling her anger she had anger a anger other directed emotions at her. yeah and yeah. wanting to influence people as yeah. well mm -hmm. feeling like she wanted to mm. yeah mm -hmm. so we're all feeling based right so yep um where were we next anyway no so so okay we how do we feel about that definition? All right. <laughs> Bruce, you wanted to ask? Um, how do you link the pain to the sin? Like in your physical, if you've got a, you know, like... Well, if you're not sensitive to pain and you're not sensitive to your suffering and you're not sensitive emotionally, it's very difficult to link the two together frequently. So, so for example, you know, the other day you couldn't link, you know, you came up to me and said, I've got this terrible pain behind my eyes, a headache, whatever. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't link it to what was causing it. Yeah. And it's frequent because you're not sensitive to the relationship between the two and even not sensitive to the pain itself, although some pains get so intense that you start doing it, uh, you know, you start feeling it. But, but that's an example of pain. It, it, what happened the other day was Bruce came up to me and said, oh, Sunday, uh, I think it was Sunday, um, he said that, you know, he just had this terrible pain behind his eyes, he could hardly concentrate, it was just like a like big headache, you know, and just wondered what the cause was. And there was something that happened on Sunday that he wanted to suppress his sadness about. And so he said to me, well, so that means I just need to feel my sadness. And I said, no, you need to feel why you don't want to feel your sadness. So it makes sense. That's what's causing his pain, that he didn't want to feel the sadness. Not that he had sadness, but that he didn't want to feel it. 
That's what causes a lot of our pain, our intent to avoid. Like having sadness is not a sin in itself. Can you see that? Having shame, having sadness, none of that's a sin in itself. What the sin is, is avoiding the feeling of it. That is what's going to cause the pain. Avoiding the processing of it, avoiding the feeling of it. Because God designed the human soul to feel it. And when you choose to not feel, this is what the result is. You, you get pain. And, suffer, and, and if you do that for a long period of time, you'll get suffering. Does that make sense? And then as soon as you connect to it, bang, it all disappears. There's your proof. There's your proof that the suppression of the emotion is what causes the pain. You don't suppress the emotion, you, you don't have the pain anymore. Right. Knowing that would give you some faith for the next time <laughs> you have some pain. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now the definition applies to all pain. So that's all physical pain, emotional pain, pain caused by accidents, pain caused by diseases, pain caused by some kind of uh, freak event, um, everything. Laura? Let's just say, like what you're saying, if you've got the pain in your eyes, can you literally just um, actually allow the pain in the eye or the pain wherever it is to take you to an emotion if you, if you really don't know? Like no, usually not, because oh. the pain is an indication you don't want to go to the emotion. So you want to first you want to address the fact that you don't want to do it. <laughs> Not, not try to force yourself to do it. Because if you wanted to, you wouldn't even have to follow the, 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 the if you steps. Want, if you it wanted to feel the emotion already, you would not feel the pain. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't get to the pain. It wouldn't even get to the pain point, no. Pain point. Yeah. You might still have some suffering from the past, but it wouldn't get to the pain point. You follow? Yes. Yep. Um, Diane, thanks. I'm, I'm just thinking about a child mm -hmm. in that, you know, situation, feeling pain. Mm -hmm. And um, my sense is, and is, is this what's happening, that um, using myself, I'm more willing for that child to experience pain, say it's my son, I'm more willing for him to experience my pain than I am to even acknowledge my own that pain. it's my pain. I agree. Yeah. Yep, exactly true. Most of us as parents are not as good parents as we want to believe we are. Right? God's a great parent because God doesn't do any of that with us. You know, even like, like addictions and everything, like we want our children to feed our addictions, don't we? Half the time we have children, so they feed our addictions. Or so they might feed our addictions in the future at some point. <laughs> right? But God doesn't have you so that you can feed God's addictions. Um, God's always honest and truthful with you. God won't feed your addictions. Isn't that wonderful? Because if he fed your addictions, he wouldn't be a very good parent. <laughs> He'd be the same as your parent is. All right, so he chooses to not feed your addictions. He wants you to know the truth. He wants you to understand the truth. So God, God's viewpoint of the matter, completely different. So, so God wants you to experience your pain. Isn't that interesting? That's why God doesn't take it away. <laughs> How many people in the world pray for the God to take the pain away? If, if your pain goes away after praying to God for taking your pain away, I suggest to you that God is not doing it. Someone else is doing it for you. Can you see why? God's laws created the pain in the first place. Do you think God would break his own laws in order to answer your prayer? Of course not. If you have pain, it's the direct result of these things. Is God going to take it away from you? No, he's not. The reason why he's not is because you're not addressing its cause. Uh, if you were addressing its cause, that might be a different matter. But God's not going to take your pain away from you. If, any, if you pray to God and have your pain taken away, I'm telling you, you're not praying to God. You're praying to some spirit who's come along and helped you to not feel your pain. Because God's laws are there so that you feel your pain. 
And God won't do something against his own laws. Do you understand the reason why? Because it's a feedback mechanism. It's a feedback mechanism. This is what we have to understand. You see, pain and pleasure are both feedback mechanisms. God's giving you some feedback. Yeah? If we come to Sherry. So if you're suffering mm -hmm. and you don't, so you obviously don't know what the emotions are. Mm -hmm. Well, can you say that really? Well, you're... The pain's telling you probably that you're in denial of emotion and whose choice is that? Yeah, mine, yeah. So how can you say you don't know? Like you don't know specifically what the emotion is, you know... No, how can you say you don't know? Oh, I'm saying you, don't, you do know. I'm saying how can you say you don't know? It's, isn't it? What's the difference between not knowing and making a choice to not know? When you're suffering, you're making a choice to not know. Right, okay. So, so let's see it as it really is. Let's take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. The fact that I don't know is because I'm making a choice to not know. I need to take responsibility for that choice. Yeah. You follow? Yeah. So this, right now, inside of me, I have some pain. Yeah. I'm making a choice to not know its cause or to not feel it. You follow? Yeah. That, that, and and ever, all of us are the same. We've got to stop telling ourselves I, we don't know and start telling ourselves I choose yeah. to not know. Yeah. But go on, Siri. You had the rest of the question. Uh, so yes, I've chosen not to know. I've chosen to not know. But my law of attraction is doing everything to... To, to tell me what it is. To tell me what it is and yep. to trigger the H Whose emotion. law of attraction? God's. God's law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that's in place. So God's doing everything God can to try and help me to see the emotions that I don't want to feel. To expose the truth to us, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. God is. So, yep. God's okay. a wonderful parent. Very good. <laughs> always, always trying to help us. <laughs> always trying to expose to us what's going on. If we go to Nina, thank you. Um, I just want to confirm that I've understood correctly. We can stop the sin, i.e. the pain, and suffering may continue until we repent. Pain, remember, I'm talking about pain as being instant. Stop. You're now getting a bit what I'd classify as anal about the whole thing. <laughs> I'm saying one is an instant response to a particular thing. The other is long term. You understand the difference, obviously. So, so obviously, if you stop the intent to sin inside of you, then that's going to instantly reduce your pain. So, for example, you, like the example I gave to Bruce has, has the, uh, you know, hurt the pain behind his eyes. Um, the intent to sin is he has no desire to feel that he doesn't want to feel it. So, so there is an intent to sin, there's an intent to not feel it. Feel, if you feel that, the intent to not feel it goes away and therefore the pain will go away. Do you understand? But there's still sadness from something inside of him that's causing suffering long term. The instant pain might go away, but at the end of the day it doesn't mean the suffering's been released on that particular issue. Uh, you I follow see. me? Yeah, so that could be releasing the suffering could be all manner of different things. Right? Yes, like, you know, you know, it, it was triggered through the discussion on, on the Sunday for Bruce. So, so there's something in the discussion Sunday which he's suppressing emotionally that's quite powerful in his life that, that obviously instantly his desire to suppress, which was the instant sin, causes the pain, but the long-term suffering is still present even after he's no longer desired. So, he's, so let's say now it says, or he goes through a process where he no longer desires to shut down his sadness. Right? Then what will happen is the pain will still be there, the, suffer, the, the sin will still be there unless he chooses to remove it at some point in the future. Yeah. You follow? Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, if we go to Paige. AJ, just to follow on from Nina's mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So I, un I understand from what you've just explained then about the instant pain. When choosing to address the suffering and release 
the causal emotions, they, that may be a painful process. Uh, see, now you is see, that, uh, I don't think that is <laughs> myself, but anyway, you, you obviously do. Um, the, to me, once you start connecting to emotion, it feels to me like you no longer feel pain, like to me. Okay. But I know you guys think that is a painful process, but to me, one of the reasons why you think that is because of your belief about connecting with emotion. Like, if you believe emotion, experiencing emotion is a painful process, that, that's a false belief. Because the reality is, to me, feeling emotion is actually fantastic. Okay. I always enjoy that process. Cool, thank yeah, you. You've yeah, but, but I understand why you don't, because you have certain um, belief systems, emotional yeah. belief systems, that, that are the reason why you avoid that process. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So here we're talking about... Um, so, so perhaps I need to be a bit more defined here. Well, here I'm talking about not the pain of emotional release, because to me that isn't even a pain really for me. And for anybody who's actually connected emotionally, you'll find that's probably not a pain, but actually a pleasure. <laughs> um, so I, I actually feel when you actually really do connect emotionally, you experience a lot of pleasure, even though you might be crying because of some past you re, you know you're removing you're in this process removing the sin and removing the sin will be a uh, you you will interpret it as a painful process it's like it's like it's sort of like um, again if we use the illustration of a a barb in your skin um, what's more painful leaving it there accidentally touching it all the time and you know all the time being bothered by it, you can't sleep because it's there. <clears throat> what is that more painful than just get, digging around with a needle and yanking it out? Which one's better? Doesn't the digging around with a needle and yanking out actually feel relief, like in the process? So, hmm, that's how I feel. It's more like a relief than than a pain. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, in the past, I have used the terminology of ex painful experience, but uh, it's a relieving experience. This one is pain adding to pain. This one's not a relieving experience. I mean, so we're not talking about relief here, we're talking about actually feeling more of it, more of it, and more of it, and more of it, and so forth. Does that make sense? Yep. So, Barbara, thanks. <coughs> Um, I've had a few occasions where I've been in physical pain mm -hmm. and once I've connected to what was causing the physical pain and had a realisation what I was doing, the physical pain disappeared but my suffering is still there. Yes. Because I haven't dealt with the emotion attached with it. Yes. So God's grace... By me recognising and just even taking that action of recognising, I was able to relieve the instant pain, pain <coughs> yeah. but I haven't released the suffering. Yeah. That sums that up. Yeah. yeah. Most, of you, most of you have had that experience at some point. Okay, what I wanted to do is make sure that you understood too the linkage between sin out of harmony with love and breaking God's laws. That's all the same thing. Yeah. So that's very important to understand. Breaking God's laws, doing something out of harmony with love, and sinning is all the same thing. And all of those definitions are interchangeable. And remember, we should have three definitions here. Using my will out of harmony with love over a period using my will to break God's laws over a period. should be in this list here. And there's our definitions. All right, well, let's move on to pleasure, shall we? Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, pleasure is very similar, but in the opposite direction, obviously. So, pleasure... And happiness uh, 
is what we're in the end wanting, I say. So, so this is having the intent to sin inside of my soul. So pleasure would be having no intent to sin, wouldn't it? So we replace the the with no. Using my will out of harmony with love would become in using my will in harmony. Harmony with love and using my will to break God's laws would be to follow God's laws. Okay, so that seems pretty simple in terms of the definitions at least. And so happiness, if happiness was refusing to remove sin over a, long, over a period, what would it would be? So we could say not sinning over a period, couldn't we? Not using my will in harmony with love, uh, sorry, using my will in harmony with love over a period. Using my will to follow God's laws over a period would be happiness, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now, why do we feel that that's important to share with you, do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Eloisa. And if we go across to Rita on this side. Well, I reckon I've got it pretty screwed and upside down, to be quite honest. Right. And, I'm, and I reckon that it's pretty good getting it um, done this way because I think I'm doing the other... Like, for me, I've just got huge amounts, even with the pleasure thing. Like, I can look at that and go, awesome. But I'm not always recognising when I'm even having pleasure half the time. Yeah, you know what I feel a big problem is for the majority of you? You think a sin is not a sin, and you think not a sin is a sin. You think using your will in harmony with love is your definition of love, and your definition of love is most of the time not God's definition of love. Yeah. And you think that using your will to follow God's laws, most of you have no idea what God's laws are, and so what you do is you follow your own law. And then you think you should get some pleasure out of all that. Do you see? Yeah. So, so can you see receiving pleasure is all about understanding what is a sin and what is breaking God's laws and what is living in harmony with love. Can you see that? Yeah. And, and this is where we get our, ourselves all up the creek because what we're doing is we, we think a sin is not a sin. Right? We think when we're not sinning, we're actually sinning. And when we think we're sinning, we're often not sinning. <laughs> and so we're all confused. How, that was even confusing. <laughs> so we're all confused. And now, and now we go, okay, okay, uh, okay, I've got no idea what's what here. What do I do? Uh, um, oh, well, I'll just do what I believe to be right. <laughs> That's usually a sin. And usually, usually a sin. <laughs> right? And because I'm doing what I believe to be right, um, and most of the time what I believe to be right is to feed my addictions, to be frank. So, so, so of course, in the, long, the end result is we have pain, not pleasure, when we think we should be having pleasure and not pain. Or we have an instant feeling of pleasure in the sense that the whole is satisfied, but, but the long-term results tell us actually, no, it must have not been pleasure. My, my, even my definition of pleasure is like all up the creek as well. I think that if I feed my addictions, that's going to be pleasure. And that feels like pleasure to me. But why is it that I've got all this suffering? <laughs> and the reality is God's trying to say, well, if you were really sensitive emotionally, you would feel that it's not pleasure. If I... Rita. Um, you ask why is that important to know? And it's important to know because then we know where we end up at, in hell or in heaven, with our choices, <laughs> which we make daily. Yeah, but see, um, I feel too, a lot of the problem is that we're quite selfishly motivated. 
And uh, this is a big problem, you know, it's like... And the, the big problem with addiction is that it's selfishly motivated. And so what happens is that we're not, we're not contemplating the result on the other person. We're only contemplating the result on for ourselves, right? And th this is a big problem, isn't it? Because, because a lot of sin is not about ourselves so much, but about how we treat other people. So we're not we're not contemplating like what a sin really is. Most of the time, many times, we do act to a degree in harmony with love of ourselves. But unfortunately, we're perfectly willing in most cases to fully sacrifice love of another in that process. We are. Right. So we can come up with all sorts of justifications as a result of that. And then, of course, there's going to be a negative result. So, so yes, I feel it's very important to understand, Rita, so very important to understand the definitions, even more important to understand what a sin is and what breaking God's laws, what, what are God's laws, and you can see what, what does it mean to be in harmony with love? What does that actually mean? You know, at the moment, we think it means what we think it means, and that's part of our problem. We remember, right at the beginning of our, of our lesson this week, we were talking about God's definition versus our own. This is so important to get that it's God's definition of what's a sin, not yours. It's God's definition of what God's laws are, not your understanding. And it's God's definition of what love is, not yours. And the problem is, for most of us, we have no idea what God's definitions are or we believe that our definitions are already God's definitions, which is not true. Yep. So, Kelly. So, is over a period, like, specifically, it's relative to me and the amount of sin or pain in me? Because otherwise, I've had this sin and false belief and it abused my gift from God to just say I've got all the time in the world to do this you have yeah free will says that you have all the time in the world but if you were using your will lovingly uh -huh. would you tell yourself that no no because you'd say hang on a sec well I'm damaging myself I'm damaging the people around me you know it doesn't make sense for me to keep doing that and when, when anybody stands up and says, but I've got forever to work my way through this gear, I go, yeah, you've got no understanding whatsoever of what love would dictate. Because the reality is you wouldn't want to wait forever to become loving if you really understood the, the issue. And particularly if you cared about yourself or anyone else, you wouldn't do it. Right? So to me, when people say, oh, but I've got forever, they're just making an excuse to not do something now. Which is a sin, yeah. which will have consequences. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll have to face that too. Yeah. Yep. Mia, up the back. Uh, bouncing off what uh, Eloisa was saying, mm -hmm. uh, I find it extremely difficult as a mum to realise uh, when I am sinning or not because often the daughter is reflecting my injuries and I feel guilty and it's not a good indication of actually if I'm doing the right thing or not. I, I am, I'm in a complete mess often to see what is... Is sin guilt a sin? Yes. Is guilt a sin? Uh, well, guilt is an indication I might be sinning. No, guilt is a sin. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh it's not a healthy feedback mechanism. Correct, because it's a sin. <laughs> so when you feel guilty, it's not telling you any truth at all. Ah. It's a sin. Okay. So <laughs> a person really who truly loves themselves and cares about themselves never feels guilty. Okay, that's a relief. <laughs> yeah, so but, but it's a point. feeling in you, so obviously it's causing suffering for both yourself and your child. Constantly. Yeah, yeah. so when a person feels guilt, it's causing suffering for yourself and others around you. Yeah. And it causes you to make choices and decisions that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand that guilt itself is a sin and needs to be released. And what are the causes of guilt? 
maybe projections of attack uh, of what I should be? Uh, yeah, oftentimes that you then imbibe and do yourself towards yourself. Now, why would you do that? Why would you punish yourself for something that other people have already punished you for? Uh, to prevent further attack? Correct. So it's actually a fear of attack of other people that causes you to feel guilty. Okay. Does it change any of your behaviour? Well, it causes me to act really bad. All yeah. Well, yeah, it doesn't change your behaviour. Guilt yeah. never changes your behaviour. Right. Okay. Yeah. I noticed, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It actually enables your behaviour. Because yeah. you go, if I paid the penalty of being guilty, then, I'll, then I'm allowed to do it again. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay. So we're, we're okay, right? Yep. Are we okay? You sure? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, so we have this pleasure, definition of pleasure and definition of happiness. Well, now what I'd like to do is read you five statements. Because these statements to me are very, very important to your understanding of how to use your will. What's the best way to use your will? My pain and the pain of others is caused by my choices. And it will reduce if I use my will to reduce it. Or if I use my will to make different choices. So this is a benefit of using your will in a loving way. My pain and the pain of others will reduce. Now, you know what the big problem is on the planet today? The majority of us are not concerned about other people's pain. You see it all the time, right? It's like, if a war happens, as long as it happens somewhere else, everything's fine. Isn't it true? That's how most of us feel. As long as it happens somewhere else. We can be actually causing the war through our choices, right? And at the same time still feel it's fine that it's happening to somebody else. We can. Right? Just a, a simple cause of that, for example, is an example. When you go shopping, most of the time you want to get cheap prices, right? Because you've got worries about money and other things like that, right? So you choose the cheapest thing. But the cheapest thing, quite often, is damaging a lot of people. But do we care? Not really. We just choose the cheapest thing. So we're not even making a choice based on what we really want, we're making a choice on what's the cheapest. And having the cheapest frequently causes a lot of damage to other people on this planet. We're not willing to pay what something is actually worth and what, how long it actually took to make and so forth. We're only willing to pay a certain amount and as a result we engage that particular product and that particular product might be involved in all sorts of unloving processes overseas or even in our own country and we don't care because we need to make ends meet financially and that's our motivation so our motivation isn't love it's selfishness can you see that's our motivation this happens frequently doesn't it how many times we go down we we don't even know where things come from half the time do we we just choose the cheapest whatever the cheapest is is the best result for us is what we feel that's an example Thanks. This may sound as a, an excuse, but in fact, we don't know if the other products that have a higher price suffer from the same problem. We don't know because there's no open disclosure of the companies as to what, who manufactured it, where they were, what happened, how much cost was involved in manufacture, and so forth, how much profit they have, because nobody's willing to put all of their financial details on the internet. And then I go, well, how many of you have done that? And I've already asked that question, and none of you had. So that's an indication that you've got the same problem as they have. You don't want to openly disclose what you are truly doing with your money and your finances and how much you get in and how much they go out. You don't want to be transparent about it. You don't want to be. So how can you expect the world around you to be? You can't. How can you expect them to do something that you can't do? You, like... You are not making informed choices because you're not told the truth, but you don't want to tell others the truth so that they can make informed choices. <laughs> We've got to change that, right? But, but this is what we do. We don't consider the others. Glenn, thanks. Uh, 
Just stand down here. Thanks, Renee. Just the mere fact with war, we don't speak up and say anything. Even if we speak up, most of the time we're being hypocritical. Because the reality is a lot of our choices are causing the war in the first place. And our fear that's inside of us that we refuse to release and the desire that we have for safety and security that we refuse to release from within our soul is actually causing these particular problems. And we have no desire to address that emotionally. So even if we did speak up, a lot of the times we're just going to be a hypocrite doing it. Yeah. Right? And this is our problem. Stop being a hypocrite. Start... You know, changing the inner stuff that's going on that causes these particular things. Start changing the choices we make that cause those things. And now speaking up has some validity. Yeah. We're no longer being hypocrites. Well, what would some of the choices that we could change with war? Well, what are a lot of the wars caused by? You think about it. Most war is caused by someone else not having what I want or... Sorry, not w wanting what I have or somebody else not having what I have and therefore them wanting it. Most wars caused by that. If there was an equ equitable distribution of the world's resources, then there'd be less chance for war, wouldn't there? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, so what do I do with my money? I save it up. Don't spend it. Don't do things with it. Don't, I put it in the bank because I'm afraid of security and other issues. What is that, what's that doing? Um, withholding the money from, say, someone who needs it. Yeah, withholding, sharing the wealth. Now, what if those people don't want to work for it? Well, then I can't share it because the principle is if a person doesn't want to work and take responsibility for their own life, then, then they shouldn't be given things automatically. Yeah. So, so we want to make sure that we give it in such a way that where people have to do something with it rather than just give it as a gift that where, where the person you know, learns that they can be, be dependent. We don't want that. But, but there's ways to do that in a loving way, isn't there? Yeah. There's also issues like, like I want certain things, like I've just pointed out, I want, I want my fuel price to be less than a few bucks. It doesn't matter to us what the over, overall cost of that is to the earth or to the earth's resources or to other countries or any of those kind of things. Yeah. And if we examine another issue, most of the world's wars... Uh, partly caused by the fact that we make arms to have war, <laughs> right? And in fact, one third of the economies of all of the Western nations are driven by manufacture of products for war. So would I be willing to forgo one third of everything I have in order to stop war? Now, if you ask the average person that, as long as the war isn't happening in their own location, they wouldn't be willing mm, yeah. to forgo one third of what they have. It's like, it's like government. imagine the government come up with a proposition right now and said, look, we're going to take one third of everything you've got right now away from you. Now, the average person would just have a fit about that, you know? There'd be all cries of communism and socialism and, you know, there'd be cries of like, how dare they? I've worked so hard for these things. And, uh, and it would go on for centuries, wouldn't it, probably, yeah. <laughs> given our nature? You know, b by the time all of this generation had died, there'd still be an outcry about it. And, and, and yet that's what we need to do. We need to, all of our Western na nations in the end, we need to give away one third of our wealth. Thank you. So, you know, that's why Mary and myself share 90% of what we receive with other people. We, you know, we don't need what we actually receive. Yeah. But we do need it if we want to help other people. Does that make sense? So we do. We share it with other people. Yeah. So the average person would sh wouldn't share 90% of what they receive, would they? It'd be lucky if we, you know, back in the Bible days, it was 10%, <laughs> you know, of what you received. Yeah. And, and even that was a fairly good idea, really, if you think about it. If we all received, 
shared 10% of what we received with other people, then the world would already be quite a good place, wouldn't it? Like, I doubt whether there'd be so many starving people. I doubt whether there'd be 50 million children dying every year of malnutrition in the, in the world. So there's a number of things that have to change. You know, our heart has to change. Our motivations have to change. Our desire to see what our choices have on uh, the effects of our choices on other people has to change. A lot of things have to change. But none of those things will change unless we become more loving. And we can't become more loving unless we receive God's definition of love. We can't receive God's definition of love unless we're open to receiving it. So this, get, this is why I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you right now. Does that make sense? Because once you receive God's defini definition of love, your desire to do things changes. Like Many of you will, will work out, ah, oh, this is a good thing we could do. This is another good thing we can do. We could do this great thing too. We could have training programs here and educational programs there and we could do this and we can do that. And we can do it no matter whether we get you know, everyone around us agrees or not because we no longer care about whether you agree or not. We just care about whether it's the good thing or not. But, but we care too much about what everybody thinks and we care too much about our money and we care too much about our comfort and we care too much about all of these things and so we're not willing to do all of these different things. Isn't that true? All right, let's look at the suffering. My suffering and the suffering of others caused by my choices will reduce if I use my will to love. So isn't that reassuring? Like, we can actually reduce suffering on the planet, but only if I use my will to love. I can be a, a force for helping people. Now, again, most people only consider that they're suffering. They only consider their own suffering. They don't consider the suffering of others. Right? My pleasure and the pleasure of others caused by my, my choices will increase if I use my will in harmony with love. But again, most people don't care about the pleasure of others. They only care about their own pleasure. Right? My happiness and the happiness of others caused by my choices will increase. But again, most people only consider their own happiness and not the happiness of others. Right? And obviously... My relationship with God is completely dependent on me using my will in a loving way. Completely dependent. So you won't have a relationship with God unless you use your will in a loving way. Right. Now, the reason why we've raised this particular issue with you is because to us, most of you are not measuring your pain or your suffering. You're not measuring it. You're trying to ignore it. Right? And most of you think that pleasure comes from addictions being met when actually that creates more pain and suffering. And you choose to ignore that too. Right? So what, what we feel is that if you continue to ignore the true causes of pain and the true causes of suffering then of course you're probably going to continue to make decisions and choices that are using your will to not love. Right? And if you think that the things that give you pleasure, which actually cause other people in particular pain, are good, then obviously you can probably continue doing those particular things, which is a problem for your exercise of your will. Now... One thing we need to point out to you is that if you continue using your will in this purposeful manner, what can God do to change you? Isn't the answer to that nothing? It's not much God can do, is there? If I keep damaging you by my choices, and I'm not talking about whether the, da the damage being a figment of your imagination, I'm talking about the damage being real, and telling you the truth isn't damaging you, <laughs> it's actually helping you. It has to be something where I'm damaging you really. If I damage you through my choices, thinking that I'm actually doing a good thing, 
can you see it's highly unlikely I'll ever receive an education in love because I'm not going to you know it's like there's a, there's a nice scripture in the Bible although you probably won't think it's nice but anyway um, it, says, it says that when, when one of God's children are harmed it's like poking God in the eye If you think about it from that perspective, every time you've harmed one of your children or you've harmed another person on the planet, another one of God's children, it's like poking God in the eye. It sort of brings it a bit home, doesn't it, about how it feels in terms of how God feels about the issue. Now, we can't expect to receive love from God when we are harming others of God's children all the time. We've got to work through the issue, you see, don't we? We have to work through this issue. And working through the issue means that we mean to be more sensitive to what causes pain and what's the cause of pleasure. What causes suffering and what causes happiness. We need to understand what's going on. right? Now right at the beginning of this, of this talk, right back last Saturday, I, was saying to, I said to you that we, the world has no idea about what's going on most of the time. Because we do a whole heap of things that we think are good, but are actually worse. Worse than the situation. Because we don't understand God's definition of love. All right. So you can see the importance. Not only do we understand, need to understand the source of pleasure and the source of pain, the source of you know, happiness and the source of suffering, but we also need to understand what a sin is what harmony with love is and what breaking God's laws is that what, what's actually going on don't we so can you see there defines the next six presentations we give over the next two years we need to come to understand in part of our education what God's laws are and how we break them and how we live in harmony with them we need to come and understand what a sin is so we need to understand sin and understand how to remove it from ourselves. Can you see? And we need to understand what love is and we need to come to understand, have God's definition of love rather than our own. Now, there's our next seven presentations. All done. <laughs> right? And we're going to be spending a week, 30-something hours, on each one of those things. So, so, for example, understanding sin, 30 hours. Removing sin, 30 hours. Understanding God's laws, 30 hours. Engaging God's laws, 30 hours. <laughs> love, 30 hours in terms of uh, understanding what God's love is. And our love, another 30 hours. And there's our program for the next two and a half years. All right. so, so what we had to do was introduce to you in this session the concept that using or engaging our will to love and change, a key part of that is understanding the true causes of pleasure and the true causes of pain. All right. And we keep telling ourselves it's not that. You know, we keep telling ourselves it's something different to that or oftentimes we're hopeful that it's something different. But uh, we need to understand the true causes of these things if we're ever going to change. All right, well, now we have, uh, yeah, I've actually caught up five minutes. How about that? <laughs> and so now we have, uh, we'll have, oh, no, I haven't actually. I've <laughs> Let me work it out. No, I haven't caught up five minutes at all. <laughs> uh, I'm still 15 minutes behind. Anyway, um, what we'll do now is um, we'll, we'll have a short break again and then what I'd like to do is discuss more with you Q&A on this particular subject of pleasure and pain because I feel it's very important for us to grasp what's going on in our lives with regard to this problem.